The next item of business is a debate on motion number 1392 in the name of Kevin Stewart on more investment for more homes Scotland. Can I invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons? And I call on Kevin Stewart to speak to and move the motion. You have up to 13 minutes, please, Minister. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, last week, the First Minister set out our programme for government. It is a plan to build a more prosperous nation with a dynamic, sustainable and inclusive economy with public services that put people's needs first and where every individual has true equality of opportunity. We can only achieve this ambition if people can access a good quality, warm and affordable home. This government is ambitious for housing, with a commitment of over £3 billion to deliver at least 50,000 affordable homes over the next five years, of which 35,000 are for social rent. We already have a strong track record of delivery. We invested £1.7 billion in affordable housing over the lifetime of the last parliament, and we exceeded our target to, de to deliver 30,000 affordable homes by over 10%. It shows what can be done when we all work together, but the targets we have set for this parliament are much more challenging. Our ambition for housing can only be met if we work in partnership with councils, housing associations and developers to expand on what we do well, to push the boundaries of innovation and to make the housing system work for people. This is the More Home Scotland approach. More Home Scotland includes all the actions we are taking to increase the supply of every type of home and make the housing system work for people. Over the summer, I've been out and about speaking to many different people and I've been struck by how positive they are about this. In August, I visited Fern and Gardens developed by Shettleston Housing Association in Glasgow. With solar panels on the roof, an efficient heat recovery system, triple glazing, a landscape central courtyard and integrated Wi-Fi, these flats provide modern, attractive, safe and secure housing for older people. It just shows what can be done. Expanding what we do well means more investment for more housing. To achieve our ambitions, we will invest more than £572 million this financial year in affordable homes. Councils have been allocated over £100 million more than last year, and the basic subsidy rate for councils was increased by 24% in January. I'm pleased to see in statistics published today that we have a 26% year-on-year increase in the number of affordable homes approved in the period to the end of June. This is a healthy start. We are also supporting home ownership through our shared equity schemes. This year, £160 million is available to support up to 5,000 households to buy their own home, adding to the 22,000 who have already benefited through these schemes. Government investment in housing is also good for the wider economy. It will support around 14,000 jobs in the construction and related industries in Scotland and will generate £1.8 billion of economic activity each year. A substantial contribution to boosting our economy, creating jobs and investing in our future. But it cannot be done with the Scottish Government investment alone. Securing wider investment is just one reason why we keep innovating. We are the only government in the UK to invest in charitable bonds uh, and we have invested over £40 million so far. We are also pushing forward with innovation in mid-market rent. The local affordable rented housing trust will deliver up to 1,000 affordable homes across Scotland over five years, supported by a £55 million loan from the Scottish Government. Turning to rural housing, our £25 million rural housing fund is increasing the supply of affordable rural housing, prom uh, uh, two seconds, please. promoting self and custom build and supporting smaller building firms. 
I'll give way uh, to Alex Mr. Cole, Cole Hamilton. Hamilton. I thank the Minister for giving way. Uh, Liberal Democrats absolutely welcome the introduction of the Rural Housing Fund, but will the Minister speak to and act on Lib Dem calls for a commensurate island housing fund and meet with us to discuss the details of how we can meet those uh, demonstrable ne acute needs in our island communities? Kevin Stewart. Um, I think it, Mr Cole Hamilton is right uh, that it's also important to focus on the needs, housing needs of our island uh, communities. Uh, the government will therefore also establish an island's housing fund with up to five million pounds over the next three years. This accords with our positive and comprehensive vision for the islands as outlined in our programme for government. Our National Housing Trust initiative uses guarantees to unlock the development of affordable rented homes. This morning, I was at Shrub Hill in Edinburgh for the site start of the seventh NHT development in the city. This takes the total to 886 affordable homes in the city and over 2,000 across Scotland. But our housing sector can only deliver if we make the housing system work better not least our infrastructure, land, planning and tax systems. We have made supplying more homes a national strategic infrastructure priority. We are working with local authorities and through our flexible five-year housing infrastructure fund, we will unlock strategically important sites. The planning system has a critical role to play. Uh, and yesterday I attended a, a planning workshop session with uh, folks from across Scotland who will discuss planning uh, and the, on the run-up to our white paper uh, today, yesterday and today. And we will bring forward that planning bill early in the parliamentary session. Uh, and we are pressing ahead with local authorities to deliver simplified planning zones to help attract investment and promote housing delivery. Earlier this year, we published the PLACE standard to help people to work together to design and deliver successful places. Last week, I met with representatives from Sanctuary Group, Robertson, and Torrey Community Council at Craig Inches in Maureen Watts constituency in Aberdeen. Uh, they had broken ground in a development of 124 new affordable homes for key workers in Aberdeen on land previously owned by the government. This is an excellent example of making good use of public land and, and of engaging local people to provide much needed affordable housing and create a sense of place. We will make more land available for housing by modernising compulsory purchase orders and empowering communities through implementation of the Land Reform Act. In our approach to land and building transactions tax, we have prioritised support for first-time buyers and those buying homes at the lower end of the market. In the first year of the tax, more than 41,600 buyers paid less tax than they would have under UK stamp duty. Finally, we have ended right to buy to safeguard up to 15,500 existing homes for future generations. We can only succeed if we all work together. Our integrated and collaborative approach to developing the Joint Housing Delivery Plan published last year demonstrates how highly we value our partners and communities. I look forward to working with this Parliament, the Joint Housing Policy and Delivery Group and the sector to transform our ambition into reality. And I would repeat to Parliament what I have said before. I think we have a shared interest uh, in ensuring uh, that we can provide the people of Scotland with those warm, uh, affordable homes uh, that we uh, all believe should happen. Uh, and I'm willing to talk to everyone uh, in this place about how we go about the delivery of uh, that um, house building programme. As I said at the very beginning of the speech, presiding officer, um, it is an ambitious target of 50,000 affordable homes, 35,000 uh, of which will be for social rent, uh, and we will do everything possible as a government uh, to rise up to the challenge and fulfil that ambition. Thank you, President Officer.
Could you move the motion, please, Minister? I, I move the motion in my name, President Officer. I think you were so pleased at giving me some time in hand that you forgot to move the motion. <laughs> I now call on Alex Johnson to speak to and move Amendment 1392.3. Up to eight minutes, please, Mr Johnson. Thank you very much indeed, Deputy Presiding Officer. And should I fall foul of your uh, ire at the end of this, may I begin by moving the amendment that stands in my name? It is the case that we have finally got round to a debate in this Parliament where we're actually talking about what is important to people. And it may surprise many that much of what is contained in the commitments made by the Minister in the opening speech will find favour with the Conservatives. Any cursory look at the commitments that were made on housing and the Conservative Party's manifesto in May will cause you to realise that we do have a great deal in common. But we must be careful not to exaggerate our claims or achievements. And yet again, we find ourselves in the position today where the claim has been made that the commitment to 30,000 affordable homes in the last parliament was achieved. Need I point out once again that the commitment was, of course, in the manifesto at the previous election to 30,000 homes for social rent and that that was transmogrified into a commitment for 30,000 affordable homes, 20,000 of which would be for social rent. So it remains a question as to whether that was actually achieved or not. But to quote the Minister, we can only succeed if we are all working together. And I agree, and that's why I would like to start by emphasising what we have in common. We were committed in our manifesto to uh, house building becoming a national strategic infrastructure priority. And I welcome the fact that the government have made that move. We gave a commitment to a total build of 100,000 homes during the course of this parliament, 50,000 of which would be in the affordable housing sector. Again, a number that we have in common with this government. We would also wish to oversee investment in clean, secure and affordable energy because, of course, the ability to heat homes is vital. And we also want to ensure that nobody will live in a hard-to-heat home in future. While we welcome the Scottish Government's promise on house building, we do not believe it goes far enough in some areas. There is room for improvement. Not nearly enough is being done to attract the additional investment from private or institutional sources which must, might see the sector uh, become more attractive in the current economic environment. Bungled attempts to bring in investment through the dis discredited Memorandum of Understanding with China being a case in point. The motion put forward by the SNP mentions increased subsidy rates, yet it is a bit rich coming from a nationalist government to act like the champion of housing association subsidies, when in 2011 it was this government that significantly cut capital subsidy per home from an average of 70,000 down to 40,000, directly causing the collapse in the number of completions in 2012-13. No, thank you. This is like setting fire to someone's home and expecting a medal for phoning the fire brigade. More seriously, it's indicative of the minister's lazy analysis, which ran deep through his opening speech. If the minister wants to make comparisons, then let's pick some comparisons. The number of completions of, social, of uh, affordable houses in 2015 came to a total of uh, 4,037. No, thank you came to a total of 4,037. The, to the total completions in 1983, for example, at the height of the Conservative government, was 4,763. That's uh, 726 more than was achieved last year. So it's just uh, worthy of comparison that we can all draw comparisons and we can all draw conclusions. This government's obsession with the figures for council house building alone rather than for social rented housing is, as a, as a whole, further betrays their contempt for housing associations and what they have achieved. Well, Mr. Johnson, give way. Oh, OK, I finally will. Kevin Stewart. Housing associations have uh, welcomed uh, the government's commitment um, and are working in partnership with us to deliver um, the 50,000 affordable homes. 
Mr Johnson has talked about the government's record in house buildings. Uh, will he recognise uh, that we're building more homes in Scotland per head of population than England and Wales, uh, where his uh, party are in government? Alex uh, Johnson. I will acknowledge that the Scottish National Party are the government of Scotland and will be accountable for their actions in Scotland. And if they choose to fall back on the slim defence of comparison with other parts of the United Kingdom, then they themselves are in breach of their own rules uh, as far as comparison are concerned. Let's talk about Scotland and let's talk about what we can achieve in Scotland rather than doing Scotland down by comparison with other areas of the United Kingdom. <laughs> The SNP also have a very poor record on help for first-time buyers. On the 27th of September 2013, the Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Cities launched the three-year Help to Buy Scotland scheme, which allocated £130 million uh, for the financial year 2015-16. Yet this year, we see that budget significantly reduced. Also, the number of loans being given by institutions for first-time buyers remains below the quarter to 2007 level when the SNP came to power. This suggests a failure on the part of the SNP to provide adequate support for helping people on to the property ladder. The SNP have also uh, committed to cut fuel poverty, but yet the budget for uh, fuel poverty and energy efficiency has also seen reductions. The Conservative Manifesto committed to warmer homes. Scotland is a cold place most of the time, and research shows that living in a cold, damp home is much more likely to cause health problems. Increasing energy efficiency and heating homes should be a top priority. And again, the Conservative Party's manifesto for the May election offered commitments in that area. Uh, I will carry on at the moment, thank you, Minister. Uh, you had a speech of your own. We, we, we want to see ambitious, ambitious targets set for energy efficiency and we want to see all properties achieve the EPC C rating or above by the end of the decade and we are happy to work with this government in order to achieve that. We want to see more investment in energy efficiency and we don't believe that current policies go as far as they could. In the budget process on which we are about to embark, the Scottish Conservatives will support energy efficiency uh, in the budget, in budget increases. We also believe energy efficiency improvements should be reflected in the tax system. Specifically, energy efficiency improvements could be incentivised through the LBTT discounts or by business, in the business rate system. The fact that the SNP have allowed drast a drastic fall uh, in this is something that they should uh, be held to account for. In addition, there are other things I could mention. The failure uh, to adequately provide care home places is again demonstrating a lack of joined up thinking in the failure of, to comprehend housing land the housing landscape. Also, the planning system review is welcome, but the system has been an adversarial block to development for too long. As I said at the outset, there is a great deal we could have in common on this. Unfortunately, this government will persist in putting things in its motions that we cannot support. And tonight, we will vote against this motion for the simple reason that it could not avoid mentioning land reform once again. I now call on Pauline McNeill. Up to seven minutes, please, Ms McNeill. Thank you. I have the brief in this Parliament of being Labour spokesperson on housing and social justice. And that's because having a warm, secure, affordable home is at the heart of our social justice policy. Housing costs push many in Scotland into poverty. This is one of the conclusions of Naomi Eisenstadt's report, Shifting the Curve. 290,000 people were in in-work poverty, and that was before housing costs. And when including housing costs, that rises to 420,000 people in Scotland. I think we do agree, at least, that housing is a pressing issue for this Parliament. 
And in that, I can assure the Minister there is indeed a shared interest in moving towards that. Scottish Labour supports a National House Build Plan, which we think is a more definitive approach to, re to reaching the 50,000 uh, new build target. To ensure the coordination of new build homes and to support the government's desire to tackle the housing crisis in this session five of the Scottish Parliament. Scottish Labour, however, does support shelter and other housing experts that believe that that 50,000 should not be the limit of our ambition and that in fact we need 60,000 homes to stand still. Nonetheless, we support the general ethos of the government's position and we don't intend in this parliament to get into the debate about the numbers, but rather we'll get into the debate with the government about how it can be achieved. We all agree that there is an acute need for new housing on a large scale. With a 13% increase in children staying in council hostels and bed and breakfasts, a dramatic increase in the number of one-person households since 2008. And I think a Conservative estimate that there are a reported 150,000 households on council waiting lists and according to Shelter, 30,000 people are classed as being homeless. We estimate that at least 45,000 people may have been excluded from that list as stock transfer authorities appear not to be counted. Now, I do appreciate that it is hard to get accurate data on waiting times and waiting lists because of double counting. But I just asked the Minister to look into this. The whole of Glasgow is not in that picture um, because it's a stock transfer authority. It, just to give you a for instance, the Glasgow Housing Association waiting list alone is 24,000. So I just call on the Minister just to have a look at that waiting list figure. We think it's a very conservative estimate, but nonetheless illustrates the point of the need for new build housing. Well, Mr. I will certainly do. Um, thank, you. Kevin I, I, I thank you. Uh, I thank you. Uh, I thank Ms. McNeil, presiding officer, uh, for allowing a debate to take place here today because it seems that others are unwilling to take interventions very often. Um, I, I say to Ms. McNeil um, that I'm certainly willing to explore that waiting list situation. Uh, and I will uh, ask civil servants to look at that closely and uh, will report back to, to Parliament on that. Can I just say in terms of the national delivery strategy, we have the More Home Scotland Board uh, and the Joint Delivery Group, which brings together 26 organisations to deliver. Uh, we have a determination, and I'm glad to hear uh, that Labour have the uh, determination to help us in the task to deliver those homes. Pauline McNeill. Okay. I want to say more about why we want to put the emphasis on a national plan uh, uh, in due course. Um, declining first-time buyers due to the economic crash and the fact that average deposits are at a staggering £20,000 if you want to buy um, a, a new house. A factor that cannot be underestimated as being a factor in slowing down the housing market and of course the availability of mortgage loans, which I don't believe are all the responsibility of the Scottish Government. But overall, although it's improving, it is getting tough to get a mortgage these days, factors which do impinge on the housing market. Homes for Scotland who favour the building of 100,000 homes of all tenures in this fifth session call for a plan uh, to include all tenures, recognising that many people want to own their own homes. Uh, we do fully support the aim that at least 35,000 should be socially rented uh, accommodation. But we know that there are many obstacles to building, and I guess that's why Labour wants to place the emphasis on the need to take a national approach to this. We need more parliamentary time to look into the issues of planning and infrastructure and so on. But just to mention one today, the efficiency of the planning system does not necessarily seem to be fit for government policy in this area. As we see, for example, in 2015 and 2016, it was still 40 weeks um, from starting an application to finishing an application. An improvement from the previous 64 weeks, but something that has to be looked at if we're serious about reaching that 50,000 target. Well, Mr. Gilbert, I will briefly, yep. Um, Kevin Stewart. Uh, 
presiding officer, the independent panel who are looking into planning um, uh, published their report just at the beginning of my tenure as minister. The government responded very quickly to that with some uh, initial moves. Uh, we are moving very quickly uh, to that new planning white paper and I hope that the whole of parliament will become engaged. Uh, I share um, some of the fr frustrations that Ms McNeill has uh, and I want to see a much more simplified planning system which will include simplified planning zones for housing. Pauline McNeill. Yeah, we look forward to a more detailed debate on the planning system for sure. Uh, but another weakness in the government position is that house building has fallen by 40 per cent since 2007, despite the number of households increasing. And we've seen figures today that do illustrate that the targets the government previously had have not been reached. But I mentioned this uh, to illustrate the need for a more comprehensive national plan. The target of 50,000 homes uh, in this parliament is quite, uh, it would be quite an achievement and I think we have to make sure all the steps in place are to achieve that. But we also agree that some consideration of the types of homes that are needed has to be part of that essential plan. The design of homes, uh, like many others, I visited the, the BRE Innovation Park at Ravenscraig. It shows that homes for the future can be achieved with zero waste and designed, for example, for people with dementia with special measures in their homes. Uh, I do agree with the uh, aspects of the Tory motion in that when we are designing and building new homes, we do need to think about energy efficiency. The targets on uh, fuel poverty have not been met and they must be a major feature in the building of new homes. It is a policy, I believe, that can mark the success of this parliament. I don't underestimate the tasks, but I don't overestimate the hope that it will give many people who need a warm, affordable home if it can indeed be achieved in this fifth session of the Scottish Parliament. Thank you. Now move to open speeches and I call Emma Harper to be followed by Graham Simpson. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the Minister's open remarks and I am pleased to speak in this debate and in support of the Scottish Government's motion. It is clear that, that it's clear that this government is committed to treating Scotland's housing shortage with the seriousness it deserves, and I welcome the commitment from them and other partners to deliver a minimum of 50,000 affordable homes over the course of this parliament, a commitment that will represent over £3 billion worth of investment. Official statistics published today show that the number of affordable homes has improved. It's increased by 26% over the last year. So this should be welcomed across the chamber as a good early progress in meeting our ambitious target. The Scottish Government is due credit for the actions it has taken over the recent years. In the previous Parliament, a target of 30,000 affordable homes was exceeded against the backdrop of continued Westminster cuts to our capital budget. The Help to Buy Scotland Shared Equity Scheme, which has been described by Homes for Scotland as an unqualified success, boosted the supply of private homes, helping the delivery of new affordable housing. Furthermore, the, ab the abolition of the right to buy scheme in Scotland after 30 years was overwhelmingly welcomed by housing bodies. Recently, the Housing Infrastructure Fund, which invites local authorities to identify housing sites which can be unlocked as a matter of priority, was established. And in April, I was particularly pleased to see the launch of a dedicated rural housing fund. The fund, which totals £25 million, is available to community organisations, development trusts, private landowners and private developers, and is further evidence that the Scottish Government is dedicated to addressing the unique issues associated with provision of housing in rural Scotland. The Scottish Government is clearly committed to working with local authorities and other partners to deliver affordable housing. However, it is undeniable that, that the housing crisis has been, a growing, it's been growing across the whole of the UK for over a decade. I therefore believe there is a pressing need to identify the root cause of the problem. And reading through the policy literature in preparation for this debate, it struck me that one issue was raised consistently by various stakeholders, and the Minister has already mentioned this with the upcoming white paper on planning, the planning system. 
obviously is being looked at. As far back as in 2004, the Barker Review of Housing Supply concluded that a more effective planning system is vital to increased housing provision, particularly in terms of land allocation. This was supported by the Scottish Government's 2007 report, Firm Foundations. It is for this reason I welcome the Scottish Government's ongoing root and branch review of the planning system and the understanding as outlined in the More Home Scotland approach that specific action on land and planning is required to increase housing supply across all tenures. We have already seen progress on this front. The latest Scottish Government statistics showed an improvement in the time taken to decide major housing developments in 2015-16. In Scotland, we are already building more homes than anywhere else in the UK. However, to reach our bold target of 50,000 new homes, we cannot rely solely on the public sector. As the Minister's motion states, a whole systems approach to housing is essential. In their recent manifesto, Homes for Scotland rightly highlighted the private sector has a crucial role to play in delivery of affordable housing. The Scottish Government's actions to date have undoubtedly helped stimulate growth in the private housing market, but a more flexible approach by local authorities is also needed. Too often, planning burdens, bureaucracy and unpredictability impact small businesses disproportionately. Local small and medium-sized building businesses are perhaps best placed to understand the needs and the opportunities of the communities they work in. A prime example of this is in my own area, SNA Homes, where I recently visited. SNA Homes have been working with Dumfries and Galloway Council Homeless Service to provide fully furnished, supported and secure emergency accommodation for almost 25 years. They provide 24-hour support, enabling each homeless person to address the issues that contributed to their circumstances. Indeed, it's not just how many homes we build that is important, but what kind of homes. To paraphrase Homes for Scotland once again, we need to build the range of homes that meet the diverse needs and life journeys of all of those living in Scotland. I further agree with Shelters Scotland, who emphasise it is essential that we don't hit the housing target but miss the point by building ill-designed and isolated new communities. It is unacceptable that at least one in five disabled people or people living with long-term health problems who require an adapted house live somewhere that is not at all or not very suitable to their needs. We need to build housing which can be adapted as the needs of the occupant change. A house for life, mobility friendly, learning disability friendly and dementia friendly. The Stranraer business have expanded their current practice with an additional proposal with a model of supporting people with difficult health care needs. I agree with Shelter Scotland that creating a supply of affordable and adaptable housing must continue to be a top priority both for the Scottish Government and local authorities over the course of this Parliament. I support this motion. Graham Simpson to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Scotland is in the grip of a housing crisis, with the SNP now into their third term of government. A briefing issued by Shelter today spelled out the stark facts. 150,000 households on council waiting lists. Over 10,000 households stuck in temporary accommodation. And nearly 30,000 people assessed as homeless last year. One household every 20 minutes. So the first thing the minister should have been doing today is apologising. No. no. Targets are great. 50,000 affordable homes in five years sounds a lot. It is. Targets, of course, can be missed, such as the SNP's manifesto commitment in May 2011 to build more than 6,000 new socially rented houses a year. That was missed as Alex Johnson said. Their shaky record does not fill me with confidence. Now, over the summer, I was also, uh, like the minister, lucky enough to visit a number of housing associations in my patch. I heard about the great work they're doing in areas like Wishaw, 
Motherwell and East Kilbride. And I visited new council housing in East Kilbride, not the only place where new council housing is springing up. Uh, North Lanarkshire Council is to be commended for its ambitious programme to build 800 houses in the next five years. As a member of the Local Government and Communities uh, Committee, I've also seen the work being done in Glasgow by Cube Housing Association, part of the week Wheatley Group, and we sat chatted to some very satisfied tenants there. My feeling is that there's a vibrancy acro across the sector. Local housing associations are adapting and in general are offering a very good service to their customers, as Cube refreshingly calls them. There's some great work going on. I just want to praise some of it. Lanarkshire Housing Association, based in Motherwell, has focused very much on improving engagement with tenants using text messaging and an improved website alongside the tenant focus group. East Kilbride and District Housing Association has paid student bursaries to five tenants in the last year, has a partnership with a credit union and provides free school uniforms to poorer tenants. The local housing associations I visited are small, but they're up to the government's challenge. Subsidies will be vital, of course, and while they're being increased, we should remember, as Alex Johnson said, it was the SNP who cut them in the first place. Um, not, not yet, because I'm about to strike a positive note with you, Mr. Stewart. Um, if you really want to hit the 50,000 target, please make sure that some of the money filters down to the smaller housing associations. If you're serious about hitting that target, you must involve them. As Andy Young, the director of East Kilbride and District Housing Association, told me just yesterday, they're ready to help, so they're up for it. Yes. Um, Kevin Stewart. I've visited presiding officer a number of uh, smaller housing association developments over the course of the summer, uh, including Cunningham Housing Association in Ardrossan um, and uh, Shettleston Housing Association, um, uh, uh, as well as others too. Um, what I would say to Mr Simpson, uh, and I don't know if it's because he's new to this parliament, uh, the Conservative benches seem to be forgetting that the Conservatives cut our capital budgets by 26% in the last Parliament. We could have done so much more if that money hadn't been slashed by a Conservative government. Graham Simpson. Well, I, I could have done without the condescending tone describing me as a newbie and therefore not knowing very much. Uh, um, I had come up with a positive idea, which I hope is ready to take on board. Um, we need more homes across the board, uh, including privately owned homes, and here reforms to the planning system that Mr. Stewart mentioned can help, but we won't see legislation until next year. I wonder if uh, Mr. Stewart could find a way to speed up the implementation of things like simplified planning zones, where I think he would find um, support across the chamber. That could unlock and hasten development. We do need action. Overall total new builds still remain about 40% down on 2007 levels we've got, and we've got a long way to go to ensuring all our homes are warm. This should be a priority. Too many people are living in homes that are not up to scratch and that has huge implications for health and educational attainment. Living in cold damp homes results in a much higher likelihood of mental health problems, a higher incidence of respiratory disease and other physical issues. This is simply unacceptable. We need to do more. As Alex Johnson said, I think there are areas where we can unite a lot of areas. Um, and I hope I've been reasonably positive to Mr. Stewart and he'll take, take on some of my suggestions. John Mason, to be followed by Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And uh, first, if I, I would very much want to welcome the, the fact we're having a debate on housing today. It's a subject that is a huge priority for my constituents, and I have a strong personal interest in it, having worked for housing associations in the past. There is clearly a lot of good news in housing delivery in recent years. The target of 30,000 from 2011 to 16 was achieved. In fact, we got 33,490 new homes. 
And in my own local area, the Commonwealth Games Village remains a, a big success story in recent years with 700 new homes, a mixture of social rented and owner occupiers. Clearly, there continue to be challenges in the housing sector. Otherwise, why would there be a commitment to 50,000 more affordable homes in the next five years? But I do not believe there is a crisis in the way there was after the World War II or in the way there is in a country that has an earthquake or a war or something like that. I think opposition politicians need to be careful how they use words. If they use words like crisis too often, they risk the word losing its effect and they personally risk losing credibility. When we look at a title like more investment for more housing, we are clearly going to focus on additional housing stock. That is good and it's recently, as say, Kevin Stewart has mentioned, has been in my constituency twice, uh, opening developments for both Cheddleston Housing Association and West of Scotland Housing Association. New developments for own occupiers in my area continue to be in Broomhouse and Bayliston and Belvedere and Parkhead and Link Housing Association are planning mid-market rent at Dalmarnock. And I'd just like to point out uh, my thanks to Clyde Gateway and the Scottish Government for funding what was uh, for cleaning up an old power station site so that housing could be built on it. But I would like to touch on one or two other issues. And a key phrase for me in the motion is the right houses in the right place. That surely has to bring maintenance of existing stock, bring in maintenance of existing stock. And a lot of work has been done on improving energy efficiency and the linked issue of ending fuel poverty, and that is great. But there's a wider issue that many owners in tenemental stock are not investing what they need to in their properties. Examples are the estate where I myself live, which is, consists of 270 post-war flats. There are factors in place, but residents only pay the absolute minimum, and so only absolutely essential repairs take place. Another example I had this week was one of my staff lives in a tenement with no factor. They have major repairs to do, and some owners have led on that. Glasgow City Council is giving a 50% grant, which is great, and they are going to insist on factors for the future, which is also very welcome. But two residents are resisting the repair work and refusing access to their premises, and it seems to me there is something wrong when it remains so difficult to get repairs and maintenance done on people's homes. Now, I have mentioned factors or a lack of them in both these examples, and whether or not there is a factor in place usually depends on the title deeds and also whether residents have actually appointed a factor at all. So I think one of my questions or a couple of questions for the government today would be, do we need to consider making it compulsory to have a factor in situations where there is common property? And if so, do they need to have the power to, to, powers to do proactive maintenance? Now, I accept that some people have had a very bad experience with factors, but I think it's an issue that we need to look at if we're serious about maintaining existing homes. Returning to the provision of new housing, I welcome the proposals for a mix of housing, be that owner occupiers, social rented, private rented, etc. I have constituents for whom the help to buy scheme it has been incredibly welcome and has made the difference between them not being able to uh, buy a home and actually being able to buy one. I said I have worked for a, f a number of housing associations and I think the work they do is tremendous and especially that they can look at the whole community rather than just looking at the individual buildings. I have some agreement uh, with some of the things that Graham Simpson said, and in particular that smaller housing associations can be particularly good at knowing their tenants and their communities really well. An example of that is in Greater Easter House, which straddles both the Proven constituency and my Shettleston constituency, where eight associations are independent but work together in many areas. Most residents chose to transfer to the community associations rather than staying with Glasgow Housing Association when the council stock was transferred. However, now in Glasgow, the council allocates the grant and sometimes the land for new housing developments. And there is a feeling that there seems to be an unhealthily close relationship between the council and Wheatley Group, which consists mainly of GHA. There is a strategic agreement between the council and Wheatley Group, and that in itself can be a good thing. But I think the fear is that it squeezes out smaller housing associations, which I think was the point that Graham Simpson was making. And they probably know their communities better, eh, and I would have concerns if that was the case. Housing continues to be the subject that most residents raise with me, and I have to say the right to buy stripped our area of some of its best housing in the social rented sector. And if Graham Simpson wants an apology, then I would like to hear an apology from the Tories for having right to buy and for decimating the uh, housing stock. 
in particular properties that say, uh, and members in his last minute. Okay. And in particular, properties at the ground floor level have reduced in the social rented sector, which, when we have an ageing population, that has meant demand seriously outstripping reply, supply. So I am delighted that Right to Buy has been stopped. But I finish by welcoming this government's commitment to housing. Of course, we're not going to solve all the challenges overnight, but at a time of financial pressure, a commitment to 50,000 new affordable homes is absolutely tremendous. And I hope that all parties can at least agree to welcome that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Call Richard Leonard, to be followed by Kate Forbes. Mr Leonard, please. Uh, can I say, Deputy Presiding Officer, that I welcome the opportunity to contribute to this debate. One of the principal reasons uh, for the creation of this Parliament was to drive housing policy up the political agenda. A devolved Scottish Parliament with responsibility for primary housing legislation, uh, housing investment and planning was always a critical part of the case for constitutional reform in the 1980s and 1990s, but also going back uh, to the days of John Wheatley and the Reverend James Barr. And the Reverend James Barr's name reminds me that next uh, year is the centenary of the Royal Commission on the Housing of the Industrial Population of Scotland, Rural and Urban, chaired by Sir Henry Ballantyne, uh, which included amongst its membership the Reverend James Barr, later to become a Labour MP. And it was set up following representations by the county medical officers and the Scottish Miners Federation uh, about the terrible housing conditions in Scotland's coalfields. And the commission concluded, and I quote, problems such as child welfare, care of mothers, better education, temperance, and the living wage are all relevant to the housing problems. And these are the problems, uh, well, perhaps not temperance, that we will be grappling with this afternoon and in the debate in the weeks and months ahead on housing. The recommendation of that Royal Commission uh, was a massive programme of council house building. Uh, well, maybe even a moderate programme of council house building uh, would be welcome. Deputy Presiding Officer, we meet this afternoon uh, knowing that 10,500 households are homeless and are in temporary accommodation in Scotland, and over a quarter of these households have children. And I put it then to the Scottish Government that what chance have we got of closing the educational attainment gap when too many of our children live in substandard and overcrowded accommodation? And that's why this month's shelter has called for a new homelessness strategy. They are looking for political leadership from this Parliament today to galvanise action with a common vision and a common goal. And given the force of argument put forward by the one organisation that is best placed to comment on this matter, I am going to assume that the government will recognise the need uh, for just such a strategy and will act immediately to establish a group to take this forward. The second point I want to make is this. We do not just need a technological or one-off fix here. We need a long-term plan for public housing in Scotland, one which produces a mosaic of homes that work rather than a monolithic top-down housing system which does not. It means giving a greater say for tenants and workers alike in how public housing is provided so that tenants are able to do much more than merely complain. Because if you want the confidence of the people, you must have confidence in the people. It means creating towns for people with homes and so people back in our town centres not concreting over the green belt. It means looking at repair and improvement. It means redoubling our efforts to return empty homes to use. And it means looking at new instruments like pension fund investments uh, to supplement public support. Deputy Presiding Officer, we are debating housing here today, but we need decisions on housing taken locally. We need to move away from local administration back to local government. Elected councillors devising local solutions to local problems, which is why I was delighted that last month North Lancashire Council announced its plan to build an extra thousand new homes. And it's why I am calling today for the letter issued by the Scottish Government to local councils in which they were warned that every housing development above 100 houses would be automatically called in. That letter should be rescinded. Yes? Minister, um, when I came into office, um, I abolished that 
That has already happened. Okay. Mr. Leonard. I apologise to the Minister for that, and uh, I'm delighted that he's corrected me. Um, the final point, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I wanted to make uh, was this. Um, th that over the time that the current uh, housing crisis has deepened, total employment in construction in Scotland has fallen. Fallen by 16,000 over the last five years, with a half of that drop, 8,000 jobs, going out of the industry over the last 12 months. Now, you do not need to have studied John Maynard Keynes's general theory on employment, interest and money from cover to cover to work out that there is an obvious place for central and local government intervention here. If the housing targets were exceeded, as the Minister has claimed again this afternoon, then on this evidence alone, it is clear that the housing targets were set too low. We need more ambition in our plans for Scotland's housing. We need the renewed political will to make tackling homelessness a priority. We need a boost in construction jobs, socially useful jobs, good jobs, local jobs, trade union jobs, as part of an anti-austerity agenda. And we need a more decentralised, localised, democratic approach. If we secure that, we will have begun to serve the purpose for which this parliament was created and the purpose for which we were elected. Thank you very much. I call Kate Forbes to be followed by Maurice Corey. Ms Forbes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's been 17 years since a house was built in Staffen on Skye, and it's been 10 years since the school roll boasted 50 children, now down at 14 pupils. One local business can cite five separate examples when it failed to recruit or retain staff because of a lack of housing. Meanwhile, the population fell by 5% in four years, from just over 600 residents in 2009 to over 550 in 2013. But before you tell me that's the trend in rural Skye, the population in Portree, a mere 30 minutes south, has risen by 11% in a decade. And it's no coincidence that the population has risen as the houses have gone up. Portree has been the beneficiary of significant housing development in the last few years under the last ambitious SNP government. Because the opportunities that this government's targets will provide to my constitu constituents can't be overestimated. In my travels and conversations, housing is repeatedly raised as one of the single greatest needs for rural Scotland. High prices, low availability and poor stock are the three key factors which push my constituents from the rural areas of Scotland to its urban centres. So I welcome every new house built in rural Scotland because it means another family whose children go to the local school, another retired couple who can remain part of the community, another individual who's driving forward the Highland economy. So yes, I welcome this government's commitment to build 50,000 new homes, but almost even more than that, I welcome the 25 million pounds of rural housing fund, which takes into account the unique issues facing rural homes. Let me sketch out four unique issues in rural Scotland that a specifically rural housing policy should address. First, there's a much higher proportion of second homes in remote rural areas at 7% versus 1% in the rest of Scotland. And this naturally makes it harder for residents to access housing. But I want to add that this is not a simple picture, especially after a summer when the Highlands has hosted unprecedented numbers of tourists who require accommodation. In fact, across Skye and Badenoch, there isn't enough tourist accommodation. And that's why organisations like Great North Lodges, based in Abbeymore, are absolutely vital to our Highland economy in managing 32 self-catering lodges, encouraging local spend, and employing a vast network of cleaning and maintenance staff, as well as full-time staff, which provides employment in an area which needs jobs and they're to be commended for their work. In a constituency like mine, there are not always easy answers, which is why a nuanced and considered approach to this is needed and more houses need to be built. Secondly, 
2012 figures show that average prices in accessible rural areas are a staggering £49,000 higher than the rest of Scotland. <coughs> Third, over three quarters of housing is owner occupied in remote rural Scotland versus just over half in the rest of Scotland. And fourthly, as already has been touched on, as a rule, housing is far less energy efficient than in the rest of Scotland. 15% of the housing stock in rural areas is in the lower bands compared to only 2% in the rest of Scotland. And that's a key reason why 22% of those living in remote rural areas like my constituency are in extreme fuel poverty compared to 9% in the rest of Scotland. But by 2021, this government will have spent £1 billion in tackling fuel poverty. It's not just that housing is less energy efficient. 47% of remote rural stock is deemed to be in a state of urgent disrepair compared to 36% in the rest of Scotland. And so this government's ambition in the last parliament and this parliament are absolutely vital, not just... Uh, yes. Minister. Um, I, I thank uh, Ms Forbes for a very well thought out speech, President Officer. Uh, one of the things which the government is doing is being innovative. Um, would Ms Forbes welcome the fact that uh, Loch Aber Housing Association are to get monies through a charitable bond uh, to build 50 new houses uh, in Fort William? Ms Forbes. I can't stress enough how absolutely delighted I was to see that announcement. Because as I was just going on to say, housing stock for my constituents is not just about a roof over your head. It's about safety, security, health, children in schools, a job, businesses growing. And it's part of a much, much bigger impact on rural Scotland. So yes, I welcome that. I've identified some of the very real pressing reasons why I welcome this government's priority and why I welcome a specifically rural fund to meet the issues that my constituents face. So thank you very much to this government. Thank you very much. <laughs> Maurice Corrie to be followed by Andy White. But Mr Corrie, please. <coughs> thank you, <coughs> Deputy Presiding Officer. <clears throat> Since 2007, the SNP have overseen a 40% drop in house building in Scotland, meaning that there are less homes for families right across our country. This 40% drop means that we have ended up in the situation where, according to the Scotland Institute, there are now over 74,000 households in Scotland suffering from overcrowding. Now, during the recess uh, just recently had, I visited the Keep Moat site in Garfield Street in Greenock and met with Lynx Housing in Lust to see social housing developments. I was impressed with these developments when addressing, which indeed addressed the local community needs. The SNP's failure on house building has meant that, according to the charity shelter, the number of people needing to live in temporary accommodation isn't coming down, and there are now over 5,000 children now living in temporary accommodation in Scotland. When you consider that over 25 that over 25 percent of people in temporary accommodation here in scotland are having to use b and b's and hostels you can see why this is such a big problem the only real way to solve these problems is, is clearly to start building more homes in scotland and that's why the scottish conservatives are committed to supporting the building of 100,000 new homes over the lifetime of this parliament at least half of which should be affordable housing whilst we need more homes in actual fact over the last nine years, house building in the private sector is down by 44%. Action must be taken to remedy this. And I recommend that the Scottish Government take some suggestions out of the Scottish Conservatives' manifesto to help encourage the house building private sector and encourage local authorities to compile publicly available brown, brownfield land registers, which would allow house builders, both big and small, to explore these options and their options more easily. Along with the presumption in favour of planning applications on Branfield sites, uh, when there is, a there is a major housing element included in the application, these proposals would be a significant amount of help to house builders here in Scotland. Moving on to the planning system, I think it is wrong that the Scottish Government is overturning half of local council's planning decisions. The SNP top-down approach for to planning permission is, I believe, wrong and misguided. We shouldn't be aiming to take away power from those that are most affected by planning decisions, but empowering them. That's why the Scottish Conservatives believe that simplifying the planning system and speeding it up 
is of the utmost importance. Not only would this support house building in Scotland by making the system easier to navigate, it would also make planning decisions easier for the public to understand and would remove some of the confusion and stress that can be felt by local communities when trying to understand why decisions can take so long to be made and why may, they are made in certain ways. Not only should we build in new houses, we should also need to ensure that the housing we do have in Scotland is more effectively managed and used. For example, there is an estimated 27,000 empty homes in Scotland. These are a wasted asset and bringing them back into use would be a good first step in providing more housing for people of Scotland. And included in this is housing for armed forces veterans and in particular disabled veterans. The Scottish Conservatives have also called for constrictions which are placed on allocation of housing from central legislation to be removed. I think everyone would agree in this chamber that allocation policy, which would be good for my constituents in the Martin, Vale of and Helensburg, Greenock and Luss, for example, may not work as well for other members' constituents in other parts of the country. An allocation policy should therefore be decided with those who are most affected by it, being the local communities. And that is why I want those decisions taken at a local level. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Joe McAlpine to be followed by James Kelly. Can I just say, and I may as well just say this rather than send notes, James Kelly, Alec Polehampton, Ben McPherson, because of the kindness and good heart of your preceding speakers, you now all have six minutes. I call Joan. I call Andy Whiteman, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I welcome this debate uh, on housing, and I want to, in my contribution, cover three key challenges that I think this Parliament has got the capacity to deal with. One is affordability, <coughs> second is housing land supply, and the third is the question of existing homes. First on affordability, Scottish Greens take the view that everyone should have access to affordable houses. All houses should be affordable, but they're not. Average prices in Scotland now double, are now double what they were in 2003 and have risen at twice the rate of inflation and outstripped average earnings by even higher a rate. As the Financial Times uh, wrote in January 2015 in a leader column, and I quote, the politics of building more houses is as tortuous as the economics is clear, but the current state of affairs cannot be allowed to continue. What Britain needs is a government Mr. brave Mr. Whiteman, could I ask you just to move your microphone a little closer for the OR so they can hear your dulcet tones? Thank you very much. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, as the Financial Times wrote in January 2015, and I quote, the politics of building more houses is as tortuous as the economics is clear, but the current state of affairs cannot be allowed to continue. What Britain needs is a government brave enough to trumpet the virtue of falling house prices and to make it happen. And that's why I'm pleased that the Scottish Green Party is, I think, the first political party in Britain to have argued that average house prices in Scotland need to fall if we're serious about affordability. With average house prices around six times average uh, earnings, this is clearly not the case at the moment. The second area is housing land supply. As has been pointed out by a number of contributors to this debate, house building targets uh, set in 2007 by the previous SNP administration have not been met. And this, in our view, in large measure, is due to a failed model of new house building dominated by the speculative volume house building industry. This stands in stark contrast to the rest of Europe, where self-procured housing is at a rate of well over 50% in most countries. In Berlin, for example, the city council helps groups of families or older people build apartment blocks to meet their housing needs. And across Germany, the inflated value of land consequent upon receiving planning permission is capped at existing use value, meaning that 90% or so of housing investment actually goes into high quality homes that are energy efficient, last far longer than the typical design life of new build houses in the UK. And this is one of the reasons why German house prices in real terms are the same today as they were in the early 1970s, where Britain's house prices have multiplied by five a key reason why Germany is a far more productive and prosperous country. To achieve a more efficient land supply um, for housing means allowing public authorities to once again acquire land at existing use value, as was the case prior to 1959, as remains the case in Germany. It means, too, ending the nonsense that government doesn't interfere in the private market. 
In the Scottish Government response in February this year to the recommendations of the Commission on Housing and Wellbeing of a national target of 23,000 new houses per year, the Scottish Government argued that, and I quote, we do not set targets for overall housing supply, as this depends heavily on the activities of the development and house building industries and is largely out with Scottish Government control. This followed the then Housing Minister Margaret Burgess's answer of 29th January to a written question from Liam MacArthur, MSP, and I quote, in Scotland we expect the private housing market to operate wherever it can without government intervention. In my view, it's surely time to admit that this laissez-faire approach to housing has failed. It's one of the reasons why in my constituency in the waterfront in Edinburgh, there are acres and acres of land lying unused, derelict, that should be, uh, have houses built on them, much of which is owned in the British Virgin Islands. Which brings me to the third challenge, which is existing homes. Presiding officer, all parties in this chamber are committed to action on warm homes. And that's very welcome, but the scale of the challenge, I think, is significant. 85% of homes that will exist in 2050 have already been built. And with much of the housing stock in poor condition, and in particular with particular problems associated with the communal tenement property, a major effort is required to bring existing housing up to modern standards, and I was glad to hear John Mason make that point. Part of this, in my view, will involve rethinking how we regard housing, not as private property, but as part of the public infrastructure of our cities and rural areas. Many of the tenement property, much of the tenement property in Edinburgh was built 100 or 200 years ago, and with the right care and maintenance will last another 100 or 200 years. In other words, these are assets to be maintained and refurbished in the long-term public interest and not for short-term financial gain. And that's why among our proposals in our manifesto were a not-for-profit repair service and a new housing investment bank. Beyond the quality of existing housing, there are also issues related to how existing housing is used. A constituent of mine here in Edinburgh commented in The Guardian last week that he was the only resident of his tenement stay in the grass market. The rest are Airbnb flats, second homes or student lets. He said, we are heading to a place where we have little in the way of community anymore. Now this could be resolved by changes to the planning regime to make a range of residential use, student accommodation, holiday homes, retirement homes, etc., subject to planning consent so that housing allocation can, better, can be better governed to maintain communities and better target different housing needs. Presiding officer, Scottish Greens are ambitious for housing. We need to transform our whole approach to housing in this country and challenge the model we have inherited, a model that I would argue is failing and one which is not delivering for growing numbers of our constituents. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I call Joan McAlpine and followed by James Kelly. Ms McAlpine, please. Thank you very much, presiding officer. I welcome the chance to speak in this afternoon's debate on housing investment a significant issue for constituents in my predominantly rural region. I want to begin by picking up on the idea of the right houses in the right places. Our rural housing strategy builds on the premise that communities should be empowered to define their own immediate local requirements and longer term aspirations. A community led approach is uh, vital to understanding the unique dynamics which inform access to housing in Scotland's more rural places. For example, in Dumfries and Galloway, it tends to be the case that private landowners will have a greater role in the provision of rental accommodation. Added to this, a higher proportion of holiday homes and empty properties inevitably create additional pressure on the already limited housing supply. This is why I want to talk about the Dumfries and Galloway Small Communities Housing Trust, an organisation which works with small rural communities to identify exactly what they think are the right houses in the right places as part of a wider drive for rural regeneration in the region. The Trust works to increase provision of a broad range of affordable housing across all tenures in rural areas and in only a short period of time they have developed an extremely productive working relationship with both the Scottish Government and local strategic partners in housing and communities. Their approach provides an exemplar of partnership working which understands local challenges but is not constrained by them. Uh, so where appropriate, they will work with large private landowners on the application of the rural housing burden, therefore maintaining long-term afford affordability in private projects. The Trust is also responsible for the delivery of the £25 million rural housing fund. 
uh, in Dumfries and Galloway. And this fund was launched by the Scottish Government in April to increase supply of affordable housing in all tenures in rural Scotland. Uh, the fund is available for three years and provides both capital support for new housing and refurbishment projects, as well as smaller contributions towards feasibility studies for relevant. The Rural Housing Fund across Scotland is open to a wide range of applicants and we need to actively encourage Scotland's rural communities to come forward and apply for a decent share of this funding. Clearly, community-led development has its own challenges, but thanks to engagement efforts of the Defrees and Galloway Small Communities Housing Trust, Housing projects are beginning to emerge, which have the potential both to increase the capacity of local development trusts and secure the longer term sustainability of small communities. At this stage, the trusts are providing support to seven applications that have progressed beyond expression of interest stage and the future development of a number of other bids. Of the seven live applications, six are from community development trusts. And these applications are benefiting from the feasibility and project development element of the Rural Housing Fund in order to facilitate community-led housing while addressing specific local demand and minimising the risk for communities. The other application relates to a private landowner. The projects are diverse in nature, promoting a range of different approaches to rural housing. And these include new build housing in partnership with the Housing Association, the purchase and refurbishment of long-term empty homes, the refurbishment of an ex-police station, seeking asset transfer from the local authority, and new build housing on land made available via the National Forest Land Scheme. The Trust value the flexibility of approach around the Rural Housing Fund and say this is particularly important for addressing small-scale, localised rural housing needs, particularly when the intervention is community-led. The Trust also reports seeing a close alignment between the Rural Housing Fund and the new Scottish Land Fund, which in turn is allowing community-led housing projects to address the key barrier, availability of land. So to conclude, I am delighted that the Scottish Government understands the unique challenges faced by rural communities. We don't just want our rural areas to survive, we want them to thrive. And that's why I welcome initiatives like the Rural Housing Fund, which allows communities to take the driving seat on innovative housing. Thank you very much. Thank you. James Kelly to be followed by Alec Cole Hamilton. Mr Kelly, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this afternoon's debate. Uh, and I believe that housing is one of the most uh, important issues that the Parliament will cons consider. And it's not just the, the case of trying to ensure that we have enough homes in the country that are wind and water tight for our citizens to stay in. It's the implications on some of the other issues that we consider as parliamentarians, because poor quality housing and lack of housing uh, can drain the ability of people to uh, advance themselves in terms of education. It can also have an impact on the health of the, the families that are impacted uh, by poor housing and therefore undermine uh, the health service budgets. And uh, another area where there's been a real growth in recent years, sadly, is, is that of mental health, uh, where poor housing has been a contributory uh, factor. Um, but, you know, in terms of my contribution, I want to look at some of the issues uh, around housing, touching how that has affected the private rented sector and explore how we need to, I think, have a proper, honest and open debate if we really want to tackle the issues that face us uh, in terms of housing in Scotland. Uh, John Mason uh, warned uh, opposition politicians about saying that there's a crisis in housing in Scotland. So I won't alarm uh, Mr Mason uh, or any of the SNP backbenchers be talking about, houses, about a crisis, but I think it is important to look at some of the statistics and what that therefore means uh, on the ground in Scotland. There's 150,000 people on housing waiting lists. 30,000 uh, of those are actually homeless and 10,000 in temporary accommodation. In Glasgow itself, 24,000 people on the waiting list, 4,500 um, homeless and four. 409, sorry, 4,500 in, in temporary accommodation and 419 uh, homeless. And that picture is replicated all over the country. If you take the example of Rutherglen and Cambus Lang Housing Association with 651 people 
on their lists and only able to, to rehouse 45 of those. Then there are real, there are real issues uh, across the country. And if you look at that compared with uh, the, the number of houses that have been built, not just uh, in the last year, but in, on, on the course of recent years, and progress um, to be kind uh, has been very slow, to say the least. Uh, in 2015, there was only 16,000 uh, housing completions. You know, that's 40% below uh, pre-recession levels. And it's not really enough to meet the challenges of the growing uh, waiting lists that, that we face. And that has an impact also in feeding into the private rented sector, where 28% uh, of 18 to 34 year olds uh, hold a mortgage. That's a, the lowest rate that it's been uh, for some time. It's 15% it's lower than at the start of devolution. And again, this uh, lack you know, of housing and affordable housing pushes up rents. The average rent in Glasgow for a two-bedroom flat is now £668. So people have put, been put under real pressure there. So I think, I think we need to be open and honest about that. Um, you know, the minister made a very earnest speech, as you would expect. He's new to the brief. He praised up the government's record. He talked about, you know, what his plans were. But I think we need to be really honest that, you know, we've got some real issues that we need to face here. And if we're looking ahead, there are real challenges because of the way budgets are going to be constrained. If you look at the Fraser, Fraser of Allender Institute report this morning saying that, you know, the potential cuts coming down the line of £1.6 billion for the Scottish Government between now and 2021. And a billion pounds of those potentially uh, are faced by local government. And that's on top of hundreds of million pounds of cuts for local government uh, in recent years. And, they, and therefore, it's no surprise that, you know, if you look at today's statistics, completions for, the, for councils and housing associations uh, are down uh, by 20%. It's no wonder if they face those financial challenges. I think the SNP need to be honest about those, about this. Sure. Minister. Um, I thank Mr. Uh, Kelly for giving way. Um, starts are up. And I think this is the most important thing as we go forward, President Officer, to make sure that new start housing continues to increase. And I'm pleased that um, housing associations and councils are stepping up to the plate in that regard. Mr Kelly. The Minister might delight himself with standing up and you know, quoting that statistic. But see on the ground, you know, people come to your surgeries staying in overcrowded accommodation. They come to your surgeries you know, with houses that aren't fit to live in because there are dampness. So there, there are real issues here that you need to acknowledge as a government minister. And you also need to be honest about the finances going forward. The, the scale of that finance means that if the SNP are really serious about achieving the targets that we've set out, they need to look at progressive taxation. This was an issue in the election. We honestly put forward a programme, said we needed to expand the public purse in order to deliver public services and not have an anti-austerity agenda. It's not enough simply to just complain about what the Tories are wrongly allocating you from Westminster. You need to look at what your powers are and what you're going to do about them. We say we face, and summing up, Deputy Presiding Officer, we face a massive crisis and it's time we had an open, honest debate, not only about how we solve the housing issues, but about how we fund it going forward. Thank you, Mr Kelly. I call Alec Cole-Hamilton, followed by Ben McPherson. Mr Cole-Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I welcome the cross-party consensus that this motion seeks to foster. And in particular, I would like to thank the Minister and indeed the Scottish Government for meeting Liberal Democrat calls for an island housing fund. The challenge before this chamber is great. Put simply, if we are to meet the national housing crisis, then we need to work together towards a comprehensive national homelessness strategy in Scotland. 
The reform of housing law to give people the right to a settled home was a landmark achievement uh, in tackling this crisis, and progress has been made. But it is incumbent upon us to build on these achievements to ensure that we see a real change for those who need it. And over the next five years, we must work together and put party differences aside to that end. I welcome the government's motion, but I would encourage them to go even further. Building 10,000 houses a year will go a long way to addressing need, but as uh, Pauline McNeill said in her speech, this must not be the limit of our ambition. And every month goes, that goes by without action makes it harder to achieve. 150,000 households are on council housing waiting lists. And despite having gold priority in my constituency, they miss out time and time again as houses come up. According to Shelter's latest report, over 5,000 children are in temporary accommodation. That's up 13% from last year and sets us back still further in our efforts to meet our obligations to Article 27 of the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child. Despite the best efforts of the Scottish Government, backed by parties from across this chamber, we are slipping ever backwards in this crucial agenda. Scotland is facing a perfect storm of unaddressed needs and indeed rising demand. The level of urgency is so profound, and I welcome the com that commitment to build 50,000 homes, but that must be the benchmark from which we seek to rise. This will only work for those in need if we meet the vision of those campaigning across our housing sector to make sure that it benefits the sharpest end of those in our society. We, do all that, we must do all that we can to make sure that those who are in need of a home are not given a disservice by this parliament if we simply to descend into a Dutch auction about numbers alone. And it is absolutely right that we address uh, the rurality problems described by Kate Forbes. And once again, I give thanks to the Minister for the Island Communities that will be helped by an island housing fund given the acute needs caused by adverse weather, transportation problems and building problems in those areas. But there, the thing in particular I want to address in my remarks today is that whole systems approach. And we have heard a lot about the problems that walk hand in hand with housing need around fuel poverty, around digital inclusion and other areas of social inequality in our society. This must be a whole systems solution. And I welcome the, the approach to that in the government motion. And to break that down into granular detail in my own constituency. We need to talk about building communities and not just houses. I'll give you some examples. The Garden City proposal for Guile falls into the footprint of Ladywell Medical Practice. If that comes on stream, that will deliver a further 4,000 patients into a, a, a doctor's surgery, which is already on its knees. Other communities, South Queensferry and Kirk Liston, are set to nearly double in size due to housing proliferation, yet despite paying Edinburgh Council tax, they are not served by affordable direct public transport links into the city on a parity with other suburban communities. And small wonder then that our Fair Affairs campaign has already gathered nearly 2,000 signatures. And finally, the, the proposals for development at Camo would see m homes built on much loved green belt, which at a stroke caused yet further gridlock at Barnton, which is the main junction on one of the most congested stretches of arterial route outside of the M25. Don't get me wrong, Liberal Democrats are not opposed in any way to development, but it must be intelligent housing development that we see brought forward. Building huge dormitory estates on the outskirts of cities without a thought given to the impact on local services, transport and infrastructure will only give rise to the manifestation of yet further inequalities in our society. That is why this week, I have written to the uh, Cabinet Secretary and Ministers asking whether the Government will consider legislation to amend the Town and County Planning Act 1997 to compel developers through Section 75 orders on planning game to construct primary healthcare facilities and developments of a certain size and to factor in pressure on arterial routes. The reality is we need to be much smarter in our housing and housing is at the centre of solving the crisis of inequality that we see right across Scotland. We need to be, see it as an enabler of giving people a better quality of life wherever they are. It's only, good, it's only by having good quality housing in the right place with local services 
transport links and broadband connectivity that meet people's needs, that we can ensure we deliver transformative change across this country exactly where it's needed. Thank you to the government for bringing this motion forward. And thank you, Mr. Cole Hampton. I call Ben McPherson, who's the last speaker in the open debate, can I remind members that all who took part in the debate must be in the chamber for the closing speeches, which follows next. Mr. McPherson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I also very much warmly welcome this debate on housing, an issue which is consistently raised with me in, in surgeries and by constituents and a top priority in my constituency. The journey towards ensuring that everyone in Scotland has access to a warm, well-designed, good quality and affordable home is of course an ongoing process and is a shared aspiration for us all as has been articulated in the, the chamber today. Today marks another positive step on that journey with ambitious and achievable proposals from the Minister and with a firm commitment from the Scottish Government to build at least, at least 50,000 affordable homes over the course of this parliamentary session, including 35,000 affordable homes for social rent. This investment will provide accommodation for families and individuals and those in need, and it will also deliver invaluable economic stimulus in these challenging financial circumstances. Presiding officer, the need to build more homes is particularly pressing here in Edinburgh, as articulated by Alex Cole Hamilton as well, where the population is growing so strongly I have the privilege of representing Leith, which is the densest urban area of Scotland. It is vibrant, diverse and bustling, and it is undergoing a process of renewal but will never lose its character. I also have the honour of representing North Edinburgh, a very, very strong community, which is also in the process of regeneration, facing challenges but undergoing positive change. Presiding officer, my constituency is already meaningfully benefiting from Scottish Government investment in affordable housing. In collaboration with the City of Edinburgh Council and various housing associations and developers, more affordable homes are being delivered in North Edinburgh and throughout Leith. For example, it was announced today that 236 new affordable homes will be built at the Shrub Hill sites, which I warmly welcome and I hope the Minister enjoyed his visit to Leith this morning. As well as having a positive benefit in itself, public sector housing investment is having a multiplier effect. It is helping to boost employment, providing opportunities to small businesses, and in my constituency, helping the vibrant creative industry grow and develop. And public sector investment is also attracting new private interest in investment. For example, in recent weeks and months, I have been in discussions with social entrepreneurs and charities about proposals for innovative housing and regeneration projects in Leith and across, across North Edinburgh, including at the, the waterfront, which Andy Whiteman rightly highlighted earlier. And I look forward to supporting these initiatives as and where I can in the coming months. Presiding officer, what's happening in my constituency is demonstrative of the fact that the Scottish Government's commitment to house building is having a positive economic effect as well as a meaningful social impact. It's encouraging confidence and creativity as well as building homes for the public good. And that's why I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to invest three billion in housing throughout this parliamentary session, three billion pounds. This capital investment will not only provide more places to live for our fellow citizens, but it will also create 14,000 full-time equivalent jobs and generate 1.8 billion pounds of economic activity a year. That's positive demand-led economic growth with multi-dimensional social benefits in challenging economic times. Presiding officer, together with measures to support the industry and help people into home ownership, Scottish Government capital investment in housing is having and will continue to have a transformative effect and that's despite Brexit, the challenges of austerity and significant cuts to Scotland's capital budget in recent years. Presiding officer, recently I met with the Rock Trust. They are a remarkable organisation doing inspiring work to support young men and women in our communities who, usually through no fault of their own, have become homeless. Young men and women who have grown up in austerity, often been subject to negative consequences of welfare reform and are part of a generation where the cost of housing 
is a major problem. We must always do more for vulnerable people in our society. And the measures proposed by the Scottish Government today to build 35,000 homes for social rent will make a difference for younger citizens, for families and for individuals. Presiding officer, through investment and legislative changes, whether that be to planning or around land reform, private sector rents or measures to address fuel poverty, the Scottish Government's programme for housing is reassuringly realistic and inspiringly ambitious. It will deliver new homes, investment in current housing stock, improved urban environments and helpful economic stimulus. It will help to create sustainable growth, promote social justice, strengthen communities and tackle inequality. For those reasons and others, I commend the Minister's bold agenda and look forward to working with the Scottish Government, other MSPs, Edinburgh City Council and housing associations and others to help deliver more affordable housing for the people I represent in Edinburgh Northern and Leith. Thank you very much. Move to winding up. I call Alec Rowley to wind up for Labour. Mr Rowley, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Today has been a positive debate, I believe, and there is a consensus within this Parliament that we need to take action to address the housing crisis that we have in Scotland. And without getting into the blame of who's, who's to blame for what, the facts speak for themselves, the statistics see, speak for themselves, and we do have a housing crisis in Scotland that needs to be tackled. I welcome the tone of the Minister's introduction speech, uh, and certainly I can say that Labour in this Parliament is absolutely committed to working with the government to deliver 35,000 and 50,000, and hopefully we could actually go further. But I know from my experience previously in Fife Council that actually being able to deliver that level of housing is not without its challenges. And that's why we have said that we actually need a national housing strategy, a plan for Scotland in terms of housing. And sitting alongside that, we need councils to be empowered to establish local housing partnerships that can deliver. Back in 2011-2012, when I was the leader of the Labour Group in Fife, we put forward a proposal in our manifesto to build 2,700 houses for rent in Fife over a five-year period. And I'm happy to say that Fife Council is on target and will deliver that 2,700 houses uh, by April of next year. And it was the experience of that that led me to produce a paper that talks about housing crisis and why we must build more public sector houses in Scotland. And this paper sets out uh, that experience and how we need to drive. It sets out the facts as to why we need to drive forward. But one of the things that I highlight in that paper is that when I was in Paisley um, last year, I met a family who had moved from a cold, damp house into a new housing association house in Paisley. And the family explained to me that the daughter uh, suffered uh, continually from asthma attacks and was very often taken to hospital. Since they moved into their new house with the fuel efficiency and everything else that's there, the little girl had not had once to go back to the hospital. So James Kelly's point about how housing is the most important issue or one of the most important issues we will debate in here because the way that it impacts on all other social policy that we will also have responsibility for in here is absolutely correct. But that family also told me that in terms of their uh, monthly income, they paid in their old damp cold house 25% of that income for uh, heating and fuel costs. When they moved into the new house, that shifted to less than 5% of their total household income. So if we are serious about tackling inequality and tackling poverty, then we have to tackle Scotland's housing crisis. That's absolutely the case. It is also the case that we should not 
somehow forget homelessness. I'd have to say that, that this year I did start to become concerned when I was reading different things for charities about the number of rough sleepers. And I found it very difficult when I went and went to try and find the statistics to see how many rough sleepers we actually had. And that's why I was pleased, uh, as, as, as Richard Leonard and Alex Cole Hamilton have, amazed, uh, have mentioned, to welcome Shetler Shelter Scotland's campaign, Homelessness Far From Fixed. Because it is far from fixed. They've launched this campaign and I hope that across this chamber we can recognise that homelessness is far from fixed and more must be done to eradicate the unacceptable situation that far too many people in Scotland still today in 2016 find themselves in, homeless. So we need to, we need to give a commitment to actually tackle that. In terms of the, the input from uh, the Conservatives, where they spoke about, Alec Johnson spoke about, it was a critique, I think, of the, of the SNP record to date, uh, and, and, and spoke about looking at other ways of being able to secure funding. And I would draw attention to Eunice in Scotland, and I hope the Minister has read the Eunice in Scotland proposals, where they look at the pension funds. And that is certainly one way where we can start to look at more investment through the pension funds. But in terms of establishing these local partnerships, it's about getting it right. Because Homes for Scotland quite rightly say that we also need to look at not just homes for rent, but homes to buy. And we need to encourage that, that process. And I'm sure we'll see a lot more about the planning uh, processes in Scotland in the coming months as we move forward. But in terms of the capacity to deliver those 35,000 social rented houses, and the 50,000 affordable houses, the capacity to do that in terms of where Fife was, was because we had such a dip in the private market. And if we got private housing moving tomorrow and we started to build the 50,000 houses in the private sector that Alec, uh, that, that, that Alec Johnson talks about, then we would have a major problem in terms of capacity because we do have a skills gap in Scotland and the building trade. And therefore, by, by being able to set out a clear strategic plan, a national house build programme for Scotland, you're able to start to plan. We're able to work with all our partners in terms of the, the colleges and start with the, the, the builders, the private sector. So we, as Fife showed, can create apprenticeships, can create local jobs, can support local companies. It's about that type of partnership. Uh, I think it was Emma Harper that talked about the need to involve uh, more local uh, housing associations and, and gave examples from her area by creating a local housing partnership in every area. And it's not about creating bureaucracy. All of that is already there. It's about bringing together the housing associations with the local authority. It's about getting the people in the same room sitting around the table, whether that's the planners, the, the, those that own the land, and starting to be able to move this agenda forward. And that's the example I would give for Fife. I would give credit to Fife. They've built 2,700 houses over this five years. Let's look at that example and let's get forward working together and tackle the housing crisis in Scotland. Now, thank you. I call on Annie Wells to wind up the Conservative Party. Ms Wells, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to close this debate today on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. As we have heard from my colleagues in the Chamber, the Scottish Conservatives believe it is one, it's necess necessary to build 100,000 new homes over the Parliament across all housing sectors. Secondly, that it is essential that the government ensures that nobody lives in a hard-to-heat home. A policy assisted by ensuring that Scotland invests in clean, secure and affordable energy. Having the ability to call a place home is one of the most instinctive human aspirations that I can think of. The shortage of housing across all sectors of the market is concerning for all, but not least for young people and growing families. I've, I've lived everywhere. I've lived, been a tenant of Glasgow City Council. I've been a homeowner. I've rented privately. But my concern now for this generation is, 
at what point is my 22-year-old son going to be able to go on the housing ladder in any capacity? Whilst I recognise the Scottish Government's attempt to combat Scotland's housing shortage with its commitment to 50,000 affordable homes over the next parliamentary session, 35,000 of which will be social rented homes, I will repeat the sentiments of my colleague Graeme Simpson and that we need to see real action from the Scottish Government. I think it would be fair to say, following its failure to meet its original 2011 manifesto target of building more than 6,000 new socially rented houses a year, that we can be slightly cynical about the Scottish Government's ability to fulfil its own policy promises, seeing in 2015-16, for example, that this figure had dropped to less than 3,500 in the year. Yes. John Mason. I thank the member for giving way. Will she welcome the abolition of right to buy, which has been a real boost? Ms Wells. Um, John, as I, as I was actually saying, as the SNP promised 30,000 socially rented homes. They've, we have heard here today that they say they have met their target by 10%. However, when they came into power, they lowered the target to 20,000 new homes and they created 10% more than that. So, I think we are quite aware that the Scottish Government like to move their goalposts in order to, to meet targets. Um, I'd like to turn my attention now, however, to the region that I represent, and that's obviously Glasgow, for those that don't know. Um, Glasgow City Council's draft housing strategy for the next five years reveals that between 2001 and 2011, owner-occupied sector in the city reduced by 1.2 per cent, and for the social rented sector, this was a huge 10.6% reduction. In an area like Glasgow, where social rents make up a larger percentage of housing stock, an estimated 36% of its 300,000 residential properties, the impact is much greater. This pressure can be felt nowhere more than Govan Hill, where I recently I met with members of the community campaign group to discuss the issues affecting an area that has unfortunately become infamous in Glasgow. After meeting with a number of residents during a walkabout, their main concerns were of, of the appalling living conditions caused by dilapidated properties, fly tipping in the back courts, vermin and crime. Above all, however, and no doubt due to the lack of options with regard to affordable social housing, rogue landlords charging ludicrous rents came top of their list for ingraining poverty in the area. Could I just finish making this final point? Um, this is why I was very pleased to see the First Minister last week on site in Govan Hill, affordable housing scheme, and why I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to building 50,000 extra affordable homes. However, I feel there is much more to be done. Mr Stewart. Um, Minister. Thank you, President Officer. And I thank uh, Ms Wells uh, for taking the intervention. Um, Govan Hill, um, the Government has invested uh, a significant sum of money in taking over some of the properties there uh, to make sure um, that folk are, are living in uh, reasonable conditions. Can Ms Wells uh, agree with me that that investment is welcome, that there is more to be done, but in cooperation with Glasgow City Council and Govan Hill Housing Association, we have made major efforts in that regard? I'll give you an extra Thank minute you, for Minister. that if you need. Um, I, I've, I have been in Govan Hill and I know that the government is putting money into Govan Hill. I know that a £9.3 million initiative was, was done in Govan Hill on the enhanced area of four blocks of houses. However, it's, it's a bigger problem and I do welcome the fact that we are putting further investment in. But I do still think that we need to be doing more in Govan Hill um, and areas like it throughout Glasgow. But I do welcome the fact that the Scottish Government is putting the, the effort into the area. Um, I'd also just like to say that, following on from what Alex Cole Hamilton had said as well, is that when we are building houses, we need to look at the community we're building them into, and we need to put community at the heart, whether it's social housing or private housing. Um, and it was like I was at a, one of the housing associations with the minister during the recess, and it was Kalmaki Housing which I think we both agreed was a great development, but we've very much seen that the community was at the heart of it, and I would like to see more of that going forward. Um, I also want to stress today the importance of setting numerical targets for increasing housing stock across all tenures by working with the private sector. 
And it is estimated that around 1,500 private houses were built in Glasgow every year, a level of which we have not seen since 2008-2009 recession. Worryingly for Scotland as a whole, statistics reveal that private house building is down by 44 per cent since the SNP came into power in 2007. As has been proposed by the Scottish Conservatives today, we need to look beyond the 50,000 affordable homes and create an extra 50,000 homes in the private sector over the next five years. We need to be creative in how we do this, and we have proposed a number of policies that would assist with this. This could be done, for example, by providing grants to private landlords to build new properties in exchange for them letting out properties at affordable rents for a given time period and making use of empty properties and bringing them back into use. In Glasgow alone, it was estimated that as of March 2016, nearly 1,900 properties were lying vacant for more than six months. I and mean, we've already heard today that Glasgow has got a waiting list of 24,000, and this is only going to increase. Further to this, as Maurice Corey pointed out, we would also like to encourage local authorities to compile publicly accessible brownfield land registers, allowing house builders, small and large, to explore their options more easily. And the final point I would like to make is the need for the Scottish Government to prioritise making sure that no one in Scotland lives in a hard-to-heat home. Shockingly, nearly a third of households in Scotland live in fuel poverty. While the Scottish Government has proposed a half billion pound investment over the next four years, the Scottish Conservatives have recognised the importance of this issue by proposing the spending of a billion pounds over the next five years. As Alex Johnson also mentioned, energy efficiency could be incentivised through the LBTT discounts and efforts should be made to create a dynamic energy mix policy so that fuel policy can be eradicated in Scotland or at the very least start to decline. In short, the Scottish Conservatives want to see an emphasis on increased housing stock across all tenures as well as a con concerted effort on eradicating fuel poverty. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Ms. Wells. I call, on, I call on Constance to wind up for the Government. Cabinet Secretary till 5.30, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, any debate in housing is always much more than a debate about bricks and mortar, uh, important uh, though they are. The breadth and depth of issues that we all need to understand, that we need to address, and in particular, uh, understanding where we need to go further and where we need to go faster. People have touched on issues in and around infrastructure, construction, skills, finance, uh, issues of access to land uh, and, of course, planning. And many speakers uh, across uh, the chamber have rightly uh, spoke about the links between housing and social justice, our economy, our environment, fuel poverty, the attainment gap uh, and tackling uh, health inequalities. And many members have also uh, welcomed the uh, Rural Housing Fund uh, and, of course, Mr Stewart's announcement today that there will also be uh, an Islands Housing Fund uh, that will sit uh, alongside that, recognising uh, the very unique needs uh, of our island uh, communities. But I want to start by being very clear to uh, Alex Johnson that our target is at least uh, 50,000 uh, affordable homes. 35,000 of that uh, will be for uh, social rent. Uh, I'm somewhat uh, uh, puzzled by uh, his contribution where he and the Tories made no specific commitment uh, to social uh, rented uh, housing. And it is somewhat a bit of a cheek uh, of the Tories to complain about reducing budgets uh, and subsidies uh, when there was indeed a 26% uh, reduction to our uh, capital budget. Uh, and of course, the, the Tory government withdrew the Green Deal, uh, which meant there was a loss of consequential funding, uh, which could have been used for, for fuel poverty, certainly. I had a feeling Mr Johnson would take I, the bait. Mr. I, along, I, along with everyone else in this chamber, I'm sure realises that there was a squeeze on finances that took place back during the financial crisis. But it was this government in a previous incarnation that chose to target the housing budget in a single year for 40% cuts. Now, you did rein back from that because you realise how deep they were, but it was this government's decision. Cabinet Secretary. 
President mm. officer, it was also uh, this government's decision to, in the last parliament to invest £1.7 billion, uh, which supported uh, 30,000 uh, affordable homes. It was also the decision uh, of this government uh, on looking forward to invest £3 billion uh, to ensure that we achieve 50,000 uh, affordable homes. And it's also this government that chooses to invest oh, £35 million a year to mitigate uh, policies such as the bedroom tax, always mitigating uh, welfare reform. And of course, you can't have uh, a debate about housing and a debate about a whole systems uh, approach to tackling the need for more housing without acknowledging uh, the, the detrimental impact uh, of Westminster's austerity uh, and welfare reform, which most certainly has a contribution to make to rising evictions, uh, when the biggest reason for rising evictions is people unable uh, to pay their rent. On a more uh, conciliatory note, uh, President Officer, Colleen McNeill uh, acknowledged that uh, the 50,000 uh, target was ambitious and that it would indeed be quite an achievement uh, if that were to be uh, achieved. Of course, Richard Leonard uh, encouraged us all to be uh, more uh, ambitious. But what Pauline McNeill said uh, certainly struck a chord with me that we do in this chamber need to focus on the how uh, as well as the numbers and that is you know a very important point so it is important uh, that we you know recognize all of the, the underlying uh, issues as well as the Tories and others recognizing that we did indeed have a financial crash and the worst recession uh, since the depression but nonetheless, in terms of modern apprenticeships and construction, uh, that is back to pre-recession levels. That should be welcomed. Uh, I would also like to uh, gently point out uh, to, to Richard Leonard uh, when he was giving us a very interesting historical perspective on housing uh, and the role of this par parliament and its origins. I do have to uh, gently remind him uh, that it was this government uh, that had the courage uh, and took through the legislation to abolish uh, the right to buy, uh, therefore uh, guaranteeing uh, or safeguarding uh, 15,500 homes over the next decade uh, for future uh, generations. Beside officer, there was a number of really good points made about the role of local authorities, and I think Edinburgh Council, North Lanarkshire Council, uh, Fife Council, to name uh, but a few, should be uh, commended uh, for the progress they're making uh, and indeed their ambitious uh, targets at a local level uh, for affordable housing. And I think the important point uh, of learning, in particular uh, from Fife Council, is how they took an all council approach uh, and galvanised uh, efforts uh, across the public sector. Uh, uh, and in terms of um, you know, really reaching out uh, and making ambitious targets and I'm, I'm delighted to hear that they're making uh, good progress on that and I think there is much uh, for other councils to learn uh, from councils who uh, have been quite trailblazing uh, in this area. Uh, not surprisingly, President Officer, we've had much discussion about planning. Let me just quickly say that it is the, the aim of this government to simplify and strengthen uh, our planning system. Mr Stewart, um, over the summer recess, uh, announced there would be 10 immediate points of action uh, following from the, the review on planning. Uh, we will, of course, uh, bring forward a white paper before the end of the year, uh, and that will be an important uh, point for Parliament to focus on prior to the introduction uh, of the planning bill. And, of course, uh, there will indeed, uh, as evidence of imminent action, there will be pilots on simplified uh, planning zones as well. I do want to stress, presiding officer, that as a government we want to support more housing um, across all tenures. That's why we've invested heavily uh, in the Help to Buy scheme uh, that has supported 22,000 people, three quarters of whom are young people between the ages of 18 uh, and 34 uh, to purchase uh, a home of their own. Uh, I wouldn't accept Andy Whiteman's description that our approach um, is uh, just accepting of uh, the lazy fair uh, private sector. I think what we are uh, trying to do sensibly and pragmatically is to focus uh, on the levers that we have uh, to support uh, in particular uh, social housing but I do agree with his point that we have to see housing in all its forms and all its tenures uh, as part of uh, our public uh, infrastructure that contributes uh, to uh, the public good. I do want to mention, presiding officer, um, the points made about homelessness uh, and indeed uh, fuel poverty. Um, I want to reassure people that far, far from it, homelessness uh, is not uh, forgotten. Um, Alex Cole Hamilton mentioned uh, the landmark legislation that we pulled together uh, to introduce 
in this Parliament, but of course it is what happens on the ground uh, that is absolutely uh, crucial. And yes, homeless applications uh, have reduced, uh, households assessed as homeless has reduced, but I will not demure from the fact that we uh, have some uh, road to travel before we eliminate and eradicate uh, homelessness in Scotland. And then with regards to children in temporary accommodation, while the number uh, of children in temporary accommodation uh, has reduced, I actually don't want to see any child in Scotland uh, in temporary accommodation. We do, of course, have to recognise that there will be women and children who will seek refuge. There will be women and children uh, and families and men as well who will be faced with emergency situations. And there will be no alternative other uh, than to have to access temporary accommodation. But we must make sure that that temporary accommodation is for the shortest time possible and is of a suitable uh, quality. In terms of fuel poverty, presiding officer, fuel poverty is indeed 35% uh, in this country and if it wasn't for rocketing fuel costs uh, it would be about 9% and I'm glad that there is a cross-party consensus for a warm homes bill um, and it's important that we listen to the findings uh, of the strategic fuel poverty group and also the rural uh, fuel poverty group uh, prior to introducing uh, our warm ho homes bill uh, later on uh, in this parliament. Signing officer, both Alex Rowley and James Kelly uh, touched upon uh, some of the annual housing statistics uh, that are out today. Uh, and can I say there is much to be welcomed in these uh, statistics. They present a strong platform to build uh, upon to, to make further progress. But they do, of course, you know, identify some challenges. They identify challenges around uh, you know, new housing supply, new build completions that most certainly uh, will have to uh, focus on mines and certainly underlines uh, the point why we have to uh, increase our endeavours uh, and we will have to monitor progress uh, very carefully across uh, all tenures. But it is fair to say that housing starts are up by 4% and that's higher than at any time uh, since the financial crash. And affordable housing supply uh, over the year it has increased uh, by 26%. Presiding officer, this government has uh, an excellent uh, record in delivering affordable housing. In the last parliament, we actually exceeded a target of 30,000 affordable homes by 10%. And that was because when we met our target, uh, we most certainly did not stop there. The figures speak for themselves from 2007 to March 2016. We delivered 60,704 houses compared to 38,015 delivered by our predecessors in 2000, 2001 to 06, 07. And our predecessors, of course, uh, had the, the, the privilege of rising budgets. Uh, we, of course, have managed to deliver more uh, affordable housing, on average up by 24% per year, at a time where our capital budgets have been slashed, at a time uh, of uh, financial austerity uh, and crisis. And, of course, uh, we await uh, the outcome uh, with Brexit. So since 2007, presiding officer, we have indeed built more homes per head of the population in England and Wales. And comparisons uh, with our nearest friends and neighbours, they may not be the be-all and end-all, and they shouldn't be the limit of our ambition, but they're nonetheless interesting and important because this higher per capita rate of house building in Scotland has enabled 44,600 more homes than would otherwise have been built uh, at the lower per capita uh, English and Welsh rate. 44,600 homes uh, is equivalent uh, to a new town the size of Paisley, probably a point that would have been made by George Adam if he had spoken in the debate. But let me end, presiding officer, by stressing uh, the point that we will be building on the 33,000 affordable homes achieved in the last par parliament with £1.7 billion investment, ramping that investment up to £3 billion despite the uncertainty of Westminster austerity and Brexit. And we are absolutely determined to deliver at least 50,000 affordable homes, um, an ambitious target, an affordable target and a target that I believe is achievable. Thank you. That concludes our debate on more investment, more homes Scotland. We now move to decision time. There are three questions to be put. The first question is that amendment 1392.3 in the name of Alex Johnson, which seeks to amend motion number 1392 in the name of Kevin Stewart, is agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We will move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote is as follows. Yes, 29. No, 94. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 1392.4 in the name of Pauline McNeill, which seeks to amend motion number 1392 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. We will move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote is as follows, yes, 27, no, 67, there were 29 abstentions, the amendment is therefore not agreed. Uh, we now move to uh, the final question, sorry, is that motion 1392 in the name of Kevin Stewart uh, on more investment for more homes be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. We shall move to a vote. Members would ask, ask members to cast their votes now. The result of the, mo of the vote on motion number 1392 in the name of Kevin Stewart is as follows. Yes, 93, no 30, and there were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll now move to members' business. So I would ask members to try and leave quietly, and we'll take a few moments to change chairs.